I remember the operation was over, all over, and she was weeping in my arms, a salutary storm of sobs after one of the fits of moodiness that had become so frequent with her in the course of that otherwise admirable year. I had just retracted some silly promise she had forced me to make in a moment of blind, impatient passion, and there she was, sprawling and sobbing, and pinching my caressing hand, and I was laughing happily, and the atrocious, unbelievable, unbearable, and I suspect eternal horror that I know now was still but a dot of blackness in the blue of my bliss. And so we lay, when with one of those jolts that have ended by knocking my poor heart out of its groove, I met the unblinking dark eyes of two strange and beautiful children, fawnlit and nymphette, whom their identical flat dark hair and bloodless cheeks proclaim siblings, if not twins. They stood crouching and gaping at us, both in blue play suits, blending with the mountain blossoms. I plucked at the lap robe for desperate concealment, and within the same instant something that looked like a polka-dotted pushball among the undergrowth a few paces away went into a turning motion which was transformed into the gradually rising figure of a stout lady with a raven-black bob, who automatically added a wild lily to her bouquet while staring over her shoulder at us from behind her lovely carved bluestone children. Now that I have an altogether different mess on my conscience, I know I am a courageous man, but in those days I was not aware of it, and I remember being surprised by my own coolness. With the quiet murmured order one gives a sweat-stained, distracted, cringing, trained animal even in the worst of plights, what mad hope or hate makes the young beast's flank pulsate? What black stars pierce the heart of the tamer? I made low get up, and we decorously walked, and then indecorously scuttled down to the car. Behind it, a nifty station wagon was parked, and a handsome Assyrian with a little blue-black beard, un monsieur très bien, in silk shirt and magenta slacks, presumably the corpulent botanist's husband, was gravely taking the picture of a signboard giving the altitude of the pass. It was well over ten thousand feet, and I was quite out of breath, and with a scrunch and a skid we drove off, low still struggling with her clothes, and swearing at me in language that I never dreamed little girls could know, let alone use. There were other unpleasant incidents. There was the movie theatre once, for example. Lowe at the time still had for the cinema a veritable passion. It was to decline into tepid condescension during her second high school year. We took in, voluptuously and indiscriminately, oh, I don't know, 150, 200 programmes during that one year, and during some of the denser periods of movie-going, we saw many of the newsreels up to half a dozen times, since the same weekly one went with different main pictures and pursued us from town to town. Her favourite kinds were, in this order, musicals, underworlders, westerners. In the first, real singers and dancers had unreal stage careers in an essentially grief-proof sphere of existence, wherefrom death and truth were banned, and where, at the end, white-haired, dewy-eyed, technically deathless, the initially reluctant father of a show-crazy girl always finished by applauding her apotheosis on fabulous Broadway. The underworld was a world apart. There, heroic newspapermen were tortured, telephone bills ran to billions, and in a robust atmosphere of incompetent marksmanship, villains were chased through sewers and storehouses by pathologically fearless cops. I was to give them less exercise. Finally, there was the mahogany landscape, the florid-faced, blue-eyed rough riders, the prim, pretty schoolteacher arriving in roaring gulch, the rearing horse, the spectacular stampede, the pistol thrust through the shivered windowpane, the stupendous fistfight, the crashing mountain of dusty old-fashioned furniture, the table used as a weapon, the timely somersault, the pinned hand still groping for the dropped bowie knife, the grunt, the sweet crash of fist against chin, the kick in the belly, the flying tackle, and immediately after a plethora of pain that would have hospitalised a Hercules, I should know by now, nothing to show but a rather becoming bruise on the bronzed cheek of the warmed-up hero embracing his gorgeous frontier bride. I remember one matinee in a small airless theatre crammed with children and reeking with the hot breath of popcorn. The moon was yellow above the neckerchiefed crooner, and his finger was on his strum string and his foot was on a pine log and I had innocently encircled Lowe's shoulder and approached my jawbone to her temple, when two harpies behind us started muttering the queerest things. I do not know if I understood right, but what I thought I did made me withdraw my gentle hand, and of course the rest of the show was a fog to me. 
Another jolt I remember is connected with a little berg we were traversing at night during our return journey. Some twenty miles earlier, I had happened to tell her that the day school she would attend at Beardsley was a rather high-class, non-coeducational one, with no modern nonsense, whereupon Low treated me to one of those furious harangues of hers where entreaty and insult, self-assertion and double-talk, vicious vulgarity and childish despair were interwoven in an exasperating semblance of logic which prompted a semblance of explanation from me. Enmeshed in her wild words... Swell chance. I'd be a sap if I took your opinion seriously. Stinker. You can't boss me. I despise you, and so forth. I drove through the slumbering town at a fifty-mile-per-hour pace in continuance of my smooth highway swoosh, and a twosome of patrolmen put their spotlight on the car and told me to pull over. I shushed low, who was automatically raving on. The men peered at her and me with malevolent curiosity. Suddenly all dimples, she beamed sweetly at them, as she never did my orchidous masculinity, for in a sense my low was even more scared of the law than I. And when the kind officers pardoned us, and servilely we crawled on, her eyelids closed and fluttered as she mimicked limp prostration. 